Vic, I struggle with the questions of existence, and I have found the fine-tuning argument, the so-called anthropic principle which deals with it, to be wonderfully probative of the question of, uh, of reality, looking at it from all sides. How do you, as a physicist, look upon the issue of the apparent fine-tuning of the universe? Many of the constants of uh, physics were changed, we would have a different universe. And we would have, uh, we would not have life as we know it. However, you have to realize that, that uh, life is just basically organized system, or organized complex material systems, and it's perfectly possible to conceive of, of, uh, of forms of life uh, totally different from ours. We can't really use our knowledge of our own universe to, to predict how some other universe might, might look. We, we don't have the, the, the knowledge of that, but it's, it's possible. I, I've played a little game myself with the, with the constants of physics where I've, I've changed them around uh, and seen what kind of universe results. And I discovered that uh, uh, one important parameter is age of, of stars, uh, that uh, when I change the existing parameters of the universe over 10 orders of magnitude randomly, uh, I still get over half of the stars living, living the same uh, a billion years or, or, or more, this is without changing any of the laws of physics, just changing the constants. So you still get stars, you still get atoms. Uh, you, you just have different sizes and, and different properties. And uh, now, to me, that indicates that, uh, that the age of, of uh, stars are not all that fine-tuned, that you can imagine long-lived stars. And once you have long-lived stars, uh, that, that seems the primary need uh, to have some kind of complex life form, because after all, complexity does arise out of simplicity pretty naturally. We've shown this uh, uh, many times in the laboratory and, and with computer simulations. And so uh, I think the fine-tuning argument just fails right off the bat because it only applies to one form of life, and we have no way of showing that it rules out all conceivable uh, forms of life. Well, it, there are certain things that we need. We need uh, 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 agglomerations of matter. Mm -hmm. we, we can't have any form of life right. if we just have random particles mm -hmm. in, in a universe that's either totally, totally blown apart or, mm -hmm. or contracted together in, in a singularity. So, so we have to have stars. Uh, so what do, you, what do you do with the so-called uh, cosmological constant, which seems to be on the razor's edge between allowing a universe to uh, to expand and not contract immediately, mm -hmm. uh, and not expand so fast that you you never get any material bodies. Well, actually, there are, there are two different uh, fine-tuning arguments. There, one has nothing to do with the cosmological constant. It just has to do with the fact that there is this balance between uh, the expansion of the universe and and it, and, it, and it's being pulled back down by by gravity. And that, that is on a, certainly on a knife edge. The universe, uh, uh, in principle, could have contracted immediately or could have expanded uh, and never had a chance for, for conglomerates of, uh, conglomerations, I guess, <laughs> of, uh, of matter to, to form. But it turns out that the, the modern theory of cosmology called inflationary cosmology uh, which has been around now for about 30 years almost, uh, and has been amply verified by experiments, predicts just that, that uh, the universe is like a very rapidly, during the f first tiny fraction of a second, the universe, universe expanded very rapidly and is currently sort of like the surface of a, of a balloon that expanded very rapidly, which is very flat. And so uh, that flatness, this is flatness of three dimensions rather than the two dimensions of the balloon, but that flatness uh, is, is predicted by, uh, by that theory. Furthermore, that is exactly what you should get if the universe started out with zero energy. So if the universe didn't have any energy pumped into it 
by God or some other external force, then that's that's precisely what it would be. This balance between between uh, uh, the two the two forces uh, is just what naturalism would would predict. But then you also ask about the cosmological constant. Yes, because the, the odd thing about the cosmological constant is it's that it's incredibly close to zero, which your yeah. balance would have, yeah. but it's not zero. It's not zero. That's okay. Uh, the, the, the real cosmological constant problem is that when you try to calculate it in a, in, in a, in a simple way, you get uh, uh, what has to be the absolutely worst physics <laughs> result of all time, that you, you get a... You get a result that's 120 orders of magnitude too big. <laughs> well, the way I look at that is that calculation is Something's is wrong. wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> and and the, the problem is the physicists have to come up with with a, a better calculation. And if you look back at that calculation, you find it's very crude, and it doesn't take into account a number of things. Uh, in particular, uh, if you uh, apply a principle called supersymmetry. In which particles of uh, that c f c constitute matter, like electrons and quarks, uh, have the same or exist in the same numbers as the the particles uh, that we call the force particles, like the photon and the the weak bosons and so on. That if there there are two types of particles, they call fermions and bosons, it has to do with their spins, half integer spins. Or fermions, integer spins, or bosons. If you had equal numbers of each, then then the cosmological constant would be identically zero. Now, of course, we don't. We don't now have equal numbers. We we have many more bosons than fermions. However, one can imagine a situation in the early universe, because we think that the the early universe started out in maximum symmetry, and one of the symmetries it would have would be this this. Uh, supersymmetry, in which case you would have uh, a, a, a zero cosmological constant. Now, it could have changed with time. It's a thing that it's not really a constant. It's, imagine it's possible for it to have then developed uh, something equivalent to the cosmological constant that gives us the current uh, uh, acceleration of the universe. Now we know that the universe the expansion is it's not only expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion. That was a big surprise to people. And uh, we still don't understand the exact source of that expansion. It could be a, a remnant small cosmological constant, or it could be something else such as, a, as a, uh, another kind of force that we haven't uh, identified yet, but still perfectly uh, physical. So you're keeping your options open. You don't need to close it off right now. There may be mm -hmm. some other things that would be discovered. Right. Yeah. But when you're um, tucked in your bed at night thinking about uh, life and reality and existence, uh, the fine-tuning argument doesn't give you pause for thought about maybe uh, you've, uh, you've uh, maybe left something out of the equation? No. <laughs> but it's, it, I, there are a few uh, issues that remain to be, to be settled. For example, the, the uh, production of carbon in, in the... Stars do seem to uh, to be to be uh, higher than than expected, and of course, without enough carbon being produced in stars, we wouldn't have life. So that's that's one. Uh, but it, I'm not the only one out there making these kinds of calculations, and there are a number of published papers now where people have done actually far more sophisticated things than I've done, and and get results that show show if you really change things around, you could still get the possibility of universe, a universe having life. So taking our universe by itself, uh, you, uh, you have no good reason to, to uh, conclude that things are so fine-tuned. And then there's another thing about the fine-tuning argument that kind of bothers me, and that is that if God made the universe and God is perfect, why would he have to fine-tune it at all? Why wouldn't we, uh, you know, for life, if he wanted it with life to be an important ingredient, uh, especially humans, then why wouldn't he have humans being able to live any place, live on every planet, live in space? Uh, he could have done that. Uh, why did why did he 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 put us off in this little tiny corner, uh, uh, this tiny planet? And we'll never be able to move off this planet to another 
to another planet. We'll never, we'll never find another planet that is so, so, uh, conditioned, to, you know, that we are so conditioned to live on. And even that, the planet is not so great when you think about it. We, we can only live in, on a third of the area of the planet. Uh, you, uh. And only on the surface. Yeah, only <laughs> on the surface. Uh, this little thin layer. It's mostly water. Uh, the, the sunlight, uh, including ultraviolet rays, uh, cause cancer. Uh, there are disasters all, all the time that kill millions of people. It's not exactly <laughs> such a great place either. So if God really created the universe for us, he'd do a very good job. 